Big hello and welcome back to Asher Look. It's Irish history. It's Noel Salmon here, and I'm joined again by the two lads, Kieran and Stephen. And um, we're going to get straight back into it. So again, Irish life during the emergency in World War II. What really gets my blood boiling is the sheer arrogance of the Germans. Like, just, you know, the havoc that it wreaked. I know World War II, like, it was a world war. And I suppose there is collateral damage, but... You know, the sheer arrogance of the Germans and really, really, I I had no idea. Still, there's there's a bit of that. Of course, there's that. The sheer arrogance of the of the of the German Nazis. But as well as that, and, and something I'm going to touch on now when I go into my piece is the absolute defensivelessness of the Irish state. I mean, mm. yes, we were neutral, but like it, even in even in today's situation, like we need to have some form of defense for our, our country. And yeah. They didn't have it then, and we still don't have it now. And I know, obviously, we live in a very different time. And but, like, then again, like, look at what the Russians are doing in Ukraine. I mean, like, the defense just wasn't there, and you know, there was nobody held accountable for that either, really. Yeah. Um, On what? And I uh, take your point, but I suppose when when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Is my counter to that? I suppose if Ireland did have you know competent people, is there a chance that we could have been dragged into the war? Maybe not. I'm, I, I, I am just I'm just speculating. No, absolutely, and I think that's the whole purpose of this podcast is to kind of have that little kind of mini debate and like God knows what route it could have gone down. But like I'm going to talk a little bit about now and the situation within the Irish military. In World War II, i.e. the emergency, Kirill made some really interesting points about how the Irish Army tried to defend themselves against German bombs, which is probably an unfamiliar story to most people. But why is that? Because most listeners know that Ireland took a position of neutrality in World War II. And Irish neutrality, it was supported by the population of Ireland. You know, De Valera did not make many wise decisions in his tenure, but I do believe the decision to keep Ireland neutral in World War II was definitely the right decision. Now, what happened was on the 4th of September 1939, in response to the German invasion of Poland, which was, of course, the incident that sparked off World War II, there was a hastily convened all session. Okay. And they immediately declared a state of emergency, hence why the name appeared throughout Irish history of World War II was known as the emergency in this country, because the Emergency Powers Act came into effect on the 3rd of September. And it was modeled extensively on the British draft worked out during something called the Sedaton Crisis a year before. Um, they, historians refer to the fact that the Irish Act was actually much more drastic in terms of how it was devised. Because you see, for, for De Valera, the emphasis of Irish neutrality, it, it, was, it was on the preservation of Irish sovereignty. It was committing to a policy of you know, ideological and rational goals. So that was kind of his kind of brainchild about it. You know, we're Ireland, we're now independent. We're making our own decision. And in fairness, it was a wise decision. You know, the War of Independence was less than 20 years previous. You know, then came the Civil War. The country was still kind of getting itself together. So yep. in, in, in my opinion, the decision to remain neutral was the correct decision. Um, but in terms of the situation within the ranks of the Irish military, it expanded to several times its pre-war size. And a lot of men joined the army between the years of 1940 and 1941. In fact, the Irish military grew to 40,000 men by early 1942, and they were trained to repel any potential attack by Nazi Germany. Because at one stage, a German invasion did seem a realistic possibility. I even heard from a a great teacher of mine back in Drimna Castle. You might remember Mr. Lenehan here on um, Brilliant History. No, he's a good, really good lad from Galway, really uh, loved his history and um, he he told me back back in Leaving Cert History that the Germans had actually devised a plan to invade Ireland uh, via Wexford, uh, a plan given the name of Operation Green. Um, now, thankfully, that, that invasion never actually took place. I think that was basically down to the relationship that the German ambassador in Ireland had with the Irish government. But at one stage, what, what happened was the, the, the treaty ports that were agreed during the Anglo-Irish Treaty of 1921, Kieran, you mentioned them in episode one, um, they were, of course, handed back to the Irish state in 1938. And when Churchill took over from Neville Chamberlain as prime minister, Churchill wanted them back. And it was pretty logical as to why. He wanted to use them as a launch pad to defend the British Navy from U-boat attacks in the Atlantic. He was even considering the reoccupation of Ireland um, at one stage, i.e. Great Britain literally invaded Ireland to, to defend itself against Nazi Germany. Jesus. Of course... 
that event never took place either, thankfully. Um, but what was interesting about this whole period in Ireland at the time, we were obviously a neutral state, but we did have to, you know, uh, devise some form of, of, of defense. So there was a there was an, a local security force was formed under the under the control of Angarda Shiakana. It was known as the LSF. And it was formed on the 24th of May 1940 after Nazi Germany invaded France. And then in January 1941, most of the force was transferred under army control to become what Kira mentioned a short time ago was the LDF, the local defense force. Now these the members of the local defense force, they were equipped with American Springfield rifles, they wore denim uniforms, and they were trained to defend their local areas in the event of an invasion. In fact, the LDF actually reached the peak of over one hundred thousand volunteers in nineteen forty two. So Whoa. Imagine that compared with today's military, like it's probably ten or more times. <laughs> That's Ireland, yeah. That's Ireland, yeah, yeah. That's so, wow, hundred yeah. like what the population may have only been two and a half million at that stage. Yeah, not hundred percent, but like you know, it would have been pretty staggering. Like a lot of men would have been in the military or the the LDF, the local defense force, as it was known, which is pretty insane, you know, when you think about it. But and then at the outbreak of the war, so obviously you had your local defense forces, but the outbreak of the war, a coast watching service was also established. So they made use of 88 concrete lookout posts. It was manned by a circuit of around 700 soldiers. And watchers were trained to note the distance and direction of all ships and airplanes and to report these observations by telephone, often via specially constructed telephone lines back to HQ in Dublin. And then at the same time, the Irish government decided to establish a small naval force to patrol Irish waters. Okay, They were based at the old naval yard in Halbow Line, which is, of course, the present day headquarters of the Irish Navy, Halbow Line, based in Cork. And the Marine Service at the time, as it was known, was comprised of two fishery protection vessels, six motor torpedo boats. Now, these were both unsuited to ocean patrol. So, again, very, very minimal defense. Um, and there was also a Navy Reserve known as the Maritime Inscription. OK, they were formed in Dublin Port to assist the port authorities with port control, examination services, etc., and then they had other units established in other port towns, such as Waterford, Cork, um, and then in wow. Galway as well. Yeah. And then the one that interests me the most is the patrolling of the skies. So with the heightened fear of invasion in and around the summer of 1940, Kieran already touched on it, Dublin's airspace was declared a prohibited zone and warnings were issued that unauthorised aircraft entering the area would be fired on, um, which of course Kieran get the example of the North Vietnam bombing. Um, Ireland's Air Defence Command, as it was known, was based at Dublin Castle. Okay, The local air defence was born by one anti-aircraft brigade so they had a small number of anti-aircraft guns and searchlights which were assembled around the capital again not exactly a great defense against the mighty german luftwaffe and then the irish air corps the iac the irish air corps as you know them today they were sorely lacking in aircraft really really were they were very very defenseless but in the summer of 1940 they received 11 aircraft they received six hawker hinds and five miles magistrates bringing the total number of aircraft in ireland at the time to 15. So again, very little defence in the event of an attack by Germany or Britain in the sense of reoccupying Ireland. But inevitably, aircraft from both nations, Germany and Great Britain, crashed in Ireland due to you know adverse weather, navigational error, low fuel, combat jam- damage, etc. And recovery of these aircraft became the responsibility of the Irish Air Corps. Now, in most cases, there were two damaged to warrant recovery, so they probably kind of used them for useful parts and, and, and salvage weapons from them as well. But... Several RAF aircraft were actually pressed into service by the Irish Air Corps, including Hawker Hurricanes, which, of course, are almost identical to the famous RAF Spitfire. They still call the Spitfire one of the greatest aircraft ever built. Um, and July 7th, 1943, four Hurricanes arrived from Britain, but they were distinctly war weary. They were battered and bruised from the Battle of Britain and the various other engagements that Great Britain ensued in Nazi Germany at the time. But eventually... In March of 1945, very late in the day, the war is coming to an end, uh, six cannon-armed hurricanes uh, were supplied to the Irish Air Corps, and, and they were actually the last planes that were acquired by the Irish Air Corps during the emergency, i.e. during World War II. I didn't realize we'd ever had hurricanes as part of the, uh, the Air Corps. Well, yeah, it's going on me. Well, it's amazing. Yeah, and you probably find a famous image of them actually lined up in Baldonnell. Very, very similar looking to Spitfires. I'm not entirely sure what the difference actually is. They look identical. 
but you can see the Irish Air Corps roundel and uh, painted onto the side of them. So it was a bit it was a bit of a case of too little, too late. I mean, if we had a had them during the North Strand bombing in nineteen forty one, we would have had at least some form of defense against the, the bombers. Yeah. Albeit, you know, it did arrive at night time, so probably would have been a little bit more yeah, tricky for the they were, planes. The North but. Strand, it seems that they were the, the planes were flying around for quite a while, you know, enough time yeah. to scramble some so, some planes to yeah. you know uh, do something. I don't know if it would have been worse or God only knows, but yeah. Yeah, really exactly. Something. For sure, for sure. But on the topic of planes, from both Germany and Britain crash landing on Irish soil, there was obviously men piloting those planes, who of course became prisoners of war in neutral Ireland. And this is this is the next kind of topic I wanted to get on before I get into the last piece. So the most bizarre prisoner of war camp during the whole of World War II had to be in the Curragh camp in County Kildare, made famous in a movie actually starring Gabriel Bourne and Bill Campbell, known as the Brill Cream Boys. Oh, yeah, yeah grateful. Yeah, exactly. So uh, well worth a watch for any of our listeners out there to get a kind of an insight into what life could have been life, could have been like in the court of camp in World War II. Um, and it was a very, very interesting story. When I was doing a bit of research about this, I read a story about a Canadian bomber crew. Okay, They were flying out from their base in Scotland. They crash-landed in what the crew thought was in and around the vicinity of their home base, okay? They were they were sorely mistaken, right? These lads, this, after they crashed, now I believe this is true because I read it online, these lads, after they crashed, they celebrated the fact that they were still alive, basically. But they said, heck it, lads, we're going on the piss, right? So they stumbled across a pub and went in for a drink. They went into, they were stunned, right? They went in to see a group of soldiers wearing in Nazi uniforms and singing in German. They were like, what in God's name is going on? Even more confusingly, the Germans responded, to their entry by shouting at them go to your own bar the crew was soon given an explanation they got lost and they had crash landed in the Republic of Ireland <laughs> they were now literally captured just like the Germans uh, like absolutely insane story I mean wow. at the end of the, at the end oh yeah it's unbelievable and at the end of the day Eamon de Valera went to great lengths to maintain Ireland's neutrality you know as, as part of the policy he made a deal with both the British and German governments that combatants from both countries could be detained if found in Ireland and interned there for the duration of the war. Now, the official line from the Irish government was that technically these men were not prisoners of war, but guests of the state, okay, with an obligation on the state to prevent them from t- returning to the war. Now, there was plenty of different scenarios whereby, you know, Allied prisoners of war went back into, you know, service via Northern Ireland. Obviously, there were very few Germans handed back over. There was also the Donegal Corridor as well, which some of our listeners might have heard of. It was a secret deal between the Irish government and the, the the British and the Americans to allow their planes to fly over Donegal into Northern Ireland. Uh, so there was a couple of kind of caveats or nuances to Irish neutrality, you could say. But getting back into the, the piece on the Curtic camp, so between 1940 and 1943, it was about 40 British and 200 German military personnel taken to the Curtic. Uh, there were mainly air crews and men from shipwrecked U-boats and so forth. But the camp itself, well, I suppose in its appearance, it was a regular POW camp. It had guard towers, it had barbed wire, it had huts built on short stilts to prevent any tunnelling to freedom from either side. But the fence separating the Germans and the Brits were was only four feet tall. Okay, so unlike in most camps, the guards had blank rounds in their rifles. Okay, a bit ridiculous, like, you know, and then prisoners were allowed to run their own bars, apparently, with duty-free alcohol. And strangely enough, I know, it's unbelievable, but both sides enjoyed the chance to sit out the war in reasonable comfort, okay, without <laughs> any dishonourable behaviour, such as the desertion, okay? Apparently now, from the, the research I've done, the Germans were a little bit more uptight about their situation than the British. They were even given they were even given money by the local authorities in, 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 in the Korra, the uh, the Irish military who ran the camp, they were given money to allow themselves to buy civilian clothing, uh, go for trips to nearby towns, uh, Newbridge, Nice, etc. Uh, but they preferred to stay in, in their uniform inside the camp. And, and, and in fact, some German prisoners even sang Nazi songs just to piss off their British their British counterparts across the barbed wire. And it even got to the stage where the two nations held boxing and soccer matches. Uh, and <laughs> there, there, there was even the odd scuffle in pubs in Nice and Newbridge, apparently, between British and German POW. So it's all a bit mad when you think about it. Jesus. Uh, like, mad. Absolutely nuts. Like, you know, so I just thought it's worth, it's worth calling out that. Um, as I say, Curra Camp, definitely the strangest prisoner of war camp in World War II, if you want to call it that. I was like, though, like for the, the Germans, I know the, a lot of the British POWs, they weren't 
in prison that long, they were kind of brought up as which you you probably know yourself, like up to the north, the border, yeah. and then you know told to go. But I say for a lot of the Germans, it was probably like this is great. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. if they were in a British POW camp or a, a worse, a Russian POW camp, oh yeah, you know, it would have been hardship over here. It must have been like a holiday for them. And, I'd say so. I'd say it was like a holiday camp for them. Yeah. Uh, like, like, I know I've read about it. It just doesn't seem that bad. It's kind of like, yeah, you'd be happy enough, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You'd, 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 like, you're, yeah, like you're basically prepped for war. Your mm. your body and your like your physiological being is like prepped for war, but yeah. you kind of you have all this extra overspill of uh, you know adrenaline, but yeah, it, it's it. In a way, you're relieved because you're not fighting for your life or potentially like yeah. meeting your maker. So, you know, I'm yeah. sure there, there was that relief of, do you know what? I'm going to live to uh, to see the end of this, you know? Yeah, no, 100%. Um, it would have been a fascinating place to be, I'd say, the quarter camp back in the 1940s. <laughs> um, but the last piece I wanted to cover, and again, I know we're, we're kind of um, we're, we're, we're dragging this on a bit, but I think it's important to acknowledge and, and call out the 80,000 Irish born men and women from both the North and the South and who fought in World War II um, in the British Army predominantly. Um, yep. Because our, our citizens, they, they they could serve in the British Armed Forces and at least at least 50,000 served in the British Army as well as the Merchant Navy and the Royal Air Force, some rising up the ranks rapidly, some such as the youngest wing commander fighter ace in the RA, in RAF's history, a guy called Brendan Finucane, or Paddy, as he was known, He's actually killed in action in, in, in France in 1942. He's to this day viewed as one of the all-time great heroes in the RAF. Um, even though he was as Irish as me and you, lads, you know, he was raised in Dublin and moved to the UK when he was in his teens with his family. Wow. Yeah, Irish Irish, Irish fighter race, Paddy Finucane. But, um, but as well as that, there was a total of 4,983 members of the Defence Forces that deserted the Irish Army to fight with the British and Allied Forces. You know, after the war, they faced a lot of discrimination because they were viewed as deserters. They lost their rights to pensions. They were barred from holding government jobs. This story has been documented in, in recent years, but they were finally formally pardoned by the Irish government in 2013. It took a long time for them to receive that pardon because obviously they were, you know, they were fighting against tyranny and oppression. Albeit, they probably took the wrong approach instead and, and like in just deserting the Irish army, they probably could have done something a little bit more um, appropriate through the channels, but but nonetheless, their 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 cause was just, you know, and um, yeah. and, and and another piece as well. Up to t- ten thousand Irish people lost their lives in World War Two. You know, it's it's pretty staggering. And you think about the yeah. country's official position of neutrality, um, and in fact, I would say a lot of families in Ireland have a family member somewhere down the line who fought who fought in World War Two. In fact, my own grandfather, Tommy Brown, my mother's father, he actually joined the RAF as a fireman, and I believe it was his job to put out fires on the planes that came back in from bombing runs over mainland Europe. According to my man, anyways, he, he sadly died well before I was born. So I never I never got the opportunity to ask him questions about it. I tell you, I would have wrecked his head if I, if I had a man. I did retrieve some fascinating insights from my uncle John Kenny. I have to give a big shout out to John. I mentioned them earlier in the podcast. Yeah, wow. yeah I'd love to get John on because I tell you, he's a big history buff like ourselves, lads, and he's got a lot of fascinating stories. But Get him on. I will indeed. Shout out to John Kenny. But, but what I wanted to say was a bit of context about my grandfather's situation, right? So my grandfather's father, my great grandfather, Tommy Brown Sr., he was a staunch Republican. He hid guns for Thomas Clark during the period of the Easter Rising and his house was raided a number of times for the Black and Tan. So he's involved all the way from the Rising through to the War of Independence and beyond. And beyond. And then his son came along, Tommy Brown Jr., my mother's father, my grandfather. Apparently he was a tough animal of a footballer, a big Gaelic footballer. Played for a, a GAA club just at the back of my Maz Road, lads. Can you believe it? The Fox and Geese Emmets. Apparently, they were wow. not. Wow. Yeah. Hey, Mac. There you go. This uh, this coming from John Kenny, all this intel. And my my grandfather, Tommy Brown, was known as Horsey Brown because he he's a bit of an animal on the gar pitch. Uh, a bit of a <laughs> bit of a Roy Keane in his day. Nice. Um, and so, yeah, just to give you context. So, great-grandfather, Tommy Brown Sr., he was very big into the GAA as well. He was actually chairman of, du- of the Dublin County Board and he was president of the Round Towers GAA Club in Clondalk. And so, again, his father, staunch Republican, huge GAA background. And then, of course, the Second World War starts in 1949 and Tommy Brown Jr., my grandfather, joins the RAF. So, 
there's a bit of a disconnect in terms of, you know, staunch Republican father and then the son joining the RAF. Apparently there's a photo of him in his RAF uniform taking a body mode at one stage. But mm, yeah, as a serving officer in the RAF, he was supposed to take an oath of allegiance to the crown. OK, and therefore the GAA, it's an automatic ban, you know, any any form of oath of allegiance. And we know this from the Irish Treaty of 1921, how painful it was to, to deal with the oath of allegiance. But a ban was given to him. By the GAA when he got back Whoa. from the war. Yeah, and the ban was handed out by his own father. Whoa. Because he was president of Round Towers. Um and, and he had to he had to kind of follow the protocol effectively. Like, sorry, son, but you went and joined the RAF, you took the oath, so you're getting banned. Now, there is a very interesting piece I wanted to clarify in relation to, to the taking of the oath, which which my uncle John Kenny said is accurate so apparently when he was in some military hall in the uk and there was different groups of lads in line one group was going to take the oath there was another group another section up ahead that had already taken the oath so seemingly tommy my granddad him and another lad jumped ahead of another group that had already participated in reciting the oath of allegiance so apparently he actually got away without ever actually reciting the oath of allegiance but he um, still got banned, though, did he? Still got banned. Like I suppose, how can he prove? Like he was, a, he was, he was an officer in the RAF, so he can't come back and say, "Well, I didn't take the oath." And I don't yeah. think it was as simple as that, you know. Um, so fascinating stories. Like in terms of his exploits, seemingly he never smoked much about it. Not many of them did, I'd imagine. Yeah. And you know, from from speaking with my uncle John Kenny, he had he had never heard of any scenario whereby a GAA president or or you know a local. GAA club president had to ban his own son mm. from from serving in in World War Two. So Jeez. it's, it's, an, it's an incredible story. I never realized that. that yeah, Do you know when, when it comes down to it, really, you know, we have all of this um, ideology. But you know, as a hearing the stories in World War One and World War Two, mm. you know, it was a good living, and you got to yeah. you got a uniform, you got a good wage, you got to see the world. You know, yeah. a person even. In today's day and age, it's a lot more affluent than it was back in the day. But a person Absolutely. and yourself, Kieran, myself, and probably everybody listening here, your first responsibility is to yourself, and your family. wife, your yeah. your spouse, and your family, and earning a living any way you can. Yeah. So, it, yeah, <laughs> you, you you wouldn't. That's that was just the way of it, and what was seen. As you know, it was Germany, and I, I, I think we can all agree. Looking at World War One, Germany for for World War One wanted to you know take over. Their their plan was to imperialize, and they were wreaking havoc. So it was a just cause, like I would say, it was a just cause. But yeah, geez, what a story! I know it's incredible, and and look, I'm 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 a bit torn by this whole topic because you know it wasn't just. My grandfather, apparently my mother's uncle Pat was a paratrooper in World War Two. So a lot of connections in my family for people who fought in the war. Um, and for me personally, it's a bit of, it's a bit of a tricky one because, you know, my own father was a, was a Republican and definitely, you know, passed a bit of that on to myself. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit torn about how I feel about my my family members being involved in the British Army in, in, in during World War Two. But I, what I would say is when you take a step back and you acknowledge the situation, you know, number one, the country was in a mess. You know, yep. these men needed to work. Yeah. and had to support their families. This is what they needed to do. And number two, they were trying to rid the world of fascism and tyranny um, yep. and, 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 and oppression, you know. So it's the other thing I like. So in reading for myself, some of them were went for the adventure. They, you know, yeah. they, their lives were boring. Now we have the internet and we have umpteen amount of things to distract us. They didn't have those back then. The radio was there. Yes, absolutely. You know? Like, but in my family, we have the same. We have connections to me. Dad's uncle John O'Connor. He fought in Europe in World War Two in infantry, but yep. he ended up being one of the people to liberate Bergen Belsen, the concentration camp. So yep. again, like in your family, he didn't really speak about all my nanny would tell me was one time he had a few drinks on him and he, he got upset and he started crying. He says, all oh, those people, you, you can't understand. You just, you can't understand. I, just, I can't talk about it. It's of course tough. not, no. Yeah. 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 But then in my wife's family, poor great uncle, Thomas Marr, I have his World War II medals. He had immigrated to South Africa. He was, he was, he was a, a younger son, so he wouldn't inherit the, the land. 
he he immigrated to South Africa. He ended up being in the Sixth Armored Division of the South African Army. He fought in Africa against uh, Rommel, the, the, the Desert Rat. Oh, yeah. in, the the Desert Fox, isn't it? Oh, the Desert <laughs> Fox, sorry. The, 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 the Desert Rat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he's a Nazi. He was a rat. Oh, that's true. That's true. <laughs> he ended up fighting in uh, Sicily as well, in, in Italy, in the invasion of Italy. Again, he came back. And, and according to Adele's dad, he never really spoke about him. He, we yeah. have his medals and some photos of him with his tank and in looks lo- looks like Africa, but I can't be sure from the pictures. There's no telling where it is, but you can see the ruins of everything. But again, did not speak about it. Yeah. And I, I suppose, like, I remember hearing about Kotlo Shan, the, the TV presenter, he interviewed Muhammad Ali and all these people. But yeah. He, he fought in the he was in the RAF like like, like your relative like and mm-hmm. he wasn't allowed to wear his uniform when he was back in Ireland and he felt that was a slight on him. He was like, I was fighting against tyranny and all these things mm-hmm. and I come back here and I'm, I'm I'm a bad person. What's this like? You know? Yeah. I was the same in World War One as well, you know. Um something my uncle John Kenny touched on as well, like men going off and taking the King Shilling. Yeah. And coming back at a time where the rising had just happened. So Listen, very, very complex couple of periods in our history for so many different reasons. And, um, you know, it's good to good to talk about it, get out in the open. As, as my Uncle John said to me, uh, these stories need to be told and we need people to tell them. So um, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's great that we're bringing them back up you know, in, in this podcast. Yeah, it's fascinating. And you're, you're exactly right, Niall. Um, these stories need to be told because it's fascinating how we forget about our ancestors so quickly. It reminds me, based on both of your stories there, about uh, Steph was watching Dame Judy Dench, and you would you believe she's so much Irish heritage? She, yeah. um, what was that show? Who do you think you are? Yeah, and she came. That's she had true. to come. Yeah, you, you've probably seen it. She had to come back to Ireland, the uh, uh, National Museum of Ireland. She was there uh, discovering about her heritage. Yeah, but her uh, father fought in World War One, and he never wanted to talk about it. Well, mm-hmm. it turns out, you know, she was read that her father actually shot a man point blank range. So I think, you know, wow. they see a lot of things that would haunt your very soul. And even that kind of famous, yeah. that famous uh, late, late show interview with the the um, interview with Gay Bourne. There was a man there, yeah. World War One. And, you know, oh, yeah, yeah. He was there, but he's not, you know, the Jerry's, you know, you know, yeah, he, yeah, yeah. He, he sort of had he, he's he, on real in the ears. Yeah. yeah, and just take the link in the description. I will put that in. Put yes, that in. Yes. Um, but the way you know, seeing your friends, like you couldn't bury your friends, or you couldn't dispose, or 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 keep your friends' bodies because you you basically didn't have time, and you you'd see your friends getting eaten by rats. You know, things that very horrible stuff. Things yep. that you just don't want to bring. You're you're back into the normal way of life. You're back into safe zone. You don't want to relive this horror because you don't want to uh, be in the hor- like. I suppose you don't want to relay any horror to the normal way of life. You you want to have that. These men were sh- these men were like shocked to their core. Like they went through shocked. serious post traumatic stress. You know, I think, I think they, they call it seen. shell shock back in the day. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, yeah. So lads, right? There's a great documentary. Um, so for anyone who's seen Band of Brothers. Or the Pacific, the real guys, the, the the real soldiers. They made a documentary, kind of a companion piece to the but that band of brothers documentary was made. It's, uh, we stand alone together. It's fantastic, but this one's called "We uh, He Is Seeing War," and it's about what happened to the to these guys after they came back when PTSD, mental health, none of that was yeah. even in anyone's mind, and yeah. like, all yeah. of them talking about. How they dealt with this one guy, Donald Malarkey, and when he's watching the show, you know what I'm talking about. And they ask him, Well, how did you deal with it? He says, Oh, well, I didn't any good Irishman does. I drank too much. And there was other yep. people talking about how this one guy talking about his father, like watching a movie, the pattern movie with the, the shells going off, in, in, and he had been shelled and getting up and just starting punching the fridge. And that's how he dealt with it. And the mother kind of knew and yep. kind of. No, but that's these guys didn't have that. The way now soldiers can come back and that there is the, 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 the support. There's counseling and therapy and all of that sort of stuff yeah, in place with them. Yeah. People saw friends killed. It 
you know, they saw unspeakable things and yep. there, there, there was no counseling and they came back from that. And yeah, I that was just blows my mind, you know. They came back. I know, for sure. They, they led, a lot of them led good lives. Some of them didn't, but a lot of them, they raised families and, you know, we're here. Yeah, them. absolutely. No, listen, and, you know, their, their lives will never be the same again because of the stuff they saw. So that summarizes everything I wanted to cover from the perspective of the Irish military in World War II, POWs on Irish soil, and Irishmen fighting in World War II uh, for the British Army. So, Steve, I believe you're going to close us out with a church-based scandal. Really? At the start, well, what I was saying there to myself was, I was talking to myself, um, at the start of this podcast, I was thinking that this, my topic was going to be completely left field and it was going to be, you know, completely off topic to what you were talking about. But as I mentioned previously, just after I think Kieran's section, I wonder, is it all related? Because what I want to talk about is the home established in County Warford for priests who were deemed by the bishops of Ireland to be unsavoury or that they wanted to hide away, essentially. And why I say it could be related is that, you know, it, it, it forms part of the uh, Murphy Report. And the Murphy Report, as we know, as we've seen in RTE News growing up, it was a commission of investigation uh, and was conducted by the Irish government into the sexual abuse scandal in the Catholic Archdiocese of Dublin. It was a period from the 1940s to 2004. So it's it's something that we, as like where we know, we're in the early 30s. We would have been, you know, 18, 19, went hearing about all of this stuff on RT News growing up. And some of the horrors that came out about some of the priests involved with some of the, uh, the abuse, you know, not only in Ireland, but in America. And I tell you, some of the research that I did you know, really left a lump in my throat, as it has for you, Kieran, as well, when you've kind of done some of your own personal kind of connections with what you were talking about. Yeah. Some of this stuff really, you know, kind of ties in with the uh, Magdalene Laundries. And when I, I was reading some of this stuff, I was getting, uh, I was getting a heated feeling over my brain. I was getting a real, like, I don't know what it was, anger or just horror. And just a lump in my throat. And it does kind of tie in with the Magdalene Laundries, but this doesn't. As mentioned, this is a this is the story of a house in County Waterford that was established by the bishops of Ireland to to put priests essentially who were unsavory. And we'll get into what they were doing uh, later on. But yeah, so it just just kind of finishing on the Murphy report. It was the period of 1940 to 2004, and over 2,800 priests. A religious served in the Archdiocese of Dublin. And through the commission of the Murphy Report, they heard about the alleged abuse by 67 priests from 1940s uh, to 2004. Probably this, would have been much more than, than that. That was just what was reported. Was yeah, absolutely. I mean, they were moving around, moving them around like bloody chess pieces. Um, oh, God, yeah. You hear about some of the stuff where it was like, he was caught doing whatever and it's like just move somewhere else and then put in charge of the choir. I know. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just, and you know, we were watching, uh, me and Steph were looking at something last night and you, you see it time and time again, uh, absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. But this secret house, I suppose for immoral clergy set up in the 1940s and what the bishops all came, they were so horrified by a report that was released. And uh, it was called uh, it was called the House for Clergy Under Correction. And the revelations were just so appalling that they decided that they needed to do something. But they're essentially deliberately con concealing their, their work. And the true reasons of why the pri priests were sent to the home uh, in Warford, as mentioned, were completely concealed. I suppose it it like if you didn't laugh you'd cry but I suppose it does kind of derive up the connotations of Jurassic Park from Father Ted where <laughs> Saint Clavert <laughs> Saint Clavert yeah stage uh, twelve I never thought I'd see one <laughs> <laughs> Just stage twelve back off uh, I really shouldn't be here <laughs> <laughs> but um actually uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, bishops all met in Maynooth in 1946. Now I know we're kind of I'm I'm kind of jumping the gun, but and the house was to be given a name which will not have a, de a defamatory connotation. So they they weren't going to call it the 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 house for bold priests or anything like that. <laughs> it was called Saint Joseph's Home for for priests, um, and essentially it was made up of four archbishops. 
uh, 22 bishops from all 26 dioceses, north and south. And what they did, they they all pledged funds themselves to contribute to this, this particular house. And it was it was suggested that um or this home housed priests who, although kept very secretive, it it was it was actually following a report by a, a man called Dr. John Charles McCaid and uh, or sorry McQuaid, uh, the son of a doctor who at the time was using his, his enormous influence to persuade the Sisters of Mercy to actually open the first VD clinic in Ireland. I kind of go back to the point of what I was saying is, you know, the 1940s, you've seen the, the effect and uh, the impact of uh, the pandemic of 2020, like what we all felt at that time. Um, but, and I suppose going back to what I was saying there before, did the, the sudden threat of bombing and, and war kind of on our doorstep and even when I was saying that I didn't think that my section had anything to do with World War II at all but mm. I just wonder and I probably put it to both of you do you think this sudden uh, perhaps, these, perhaps these priests thought that this was the apocalypse this is the end this was God you know saying that okay this is it um, judgment day is here and that they all kind of went mad um, I suppose it will make a bit more sense when I kind of tell you the reason for this doctor wanting to, you know, have this first ever VD clinic in Ireland. Well, so John Charles McQuaid, so he became Archbishop. Um, he he was pretty much in charge of the country later on. So, yeah. you know. Uh, yeah, yeah, I remember seeing his face, yep. Yeah, so like this, this was his beginnings of his exertion of power. Uh, on the Irish day, but like uh, for me, like I think the fact that they were we were seeing, or well, not the public, but the church were seeing already that there was a heedful priest, uh, abusing priest, whatever, and saw it as a problem is more shocking. The fact that it didn't come out till the nineties. So we're in the forties here. Yeah, yeah. As you said earlier, it was in the mid nineties, with early two thousands, really, when it all came out and. Walks and all. So there's four archbishops and uh, 22 bishops from all 26 dioceses, north and south, uh, pledged themselves to contribute funds for each priest in their diocese who was sent as an inmate, effectively an inmate to this house. Uh, it was suggested that this home housed priests who, although alleged, kept very secretive, some of them involved with having venereal disease during a spike in what's uh, quote unquote. Um, immorality during World War Two, which kind of brings back the point I was mentioned that you know was this a case of the sky is falling and a rampant uh, slew of kind of you know sex and a madness ensued? You, you just don't know. Was it as a result of the war or is it just a coincidence? We'll uh, call in <laughs> or uh, comment below and and. Uh, is is this something that six seven nine seven F I one oh four? Um so in, in post-war years and uh, related to this, perhaps was a surge in unmarried women leaving Ireland out of wedlock uh, pregnancies, and it was alleged and kind of you know, if it if it walks like a duck, it, it and uh, quacks like a duck, it's a duck. Um some of these priests, and it was alleged a lot, they're in this particular home for rapes and affairs and uh, even child sex abuse. What happened to some of them, uh, the uh, unmarried mothers, as a result of this, these scandals uh, was, uh, and, and those who planned to stay in Ireland, it was the Magdalene homes, unfortunately, for these women. Yeah. But I suppose, just going back to that, the Magdalene laundries, I think, is something which warrants a separate episode. And this goes further back to the 20th century. It goes back to, I think it was the 17th or 1800s when these were first established in both north and south of the border, although it would have been one at that stage. But it, like, I think, like, I would, it's fair to say it would be our mini Holocaust, really. It was just some of the things I was saying, Niall. Mm. That it was when I was reading about some of the stuff, you know, I was saying to Kieran, a wave of anger just kind of flood me, and you kind of get this real, yeah. real lump in your throat, going, Jesus, do you know what I mean? Um, oh yeah, and, and I mean, yeah. I mean, you could, you could, you could do not only an, an entire episode, you could do an entire series on the 
the horrible things that yeah. the Catholic Church has administered into in this country, <laughs> and and even in our own, like my own my older brothers remember getting thumped around in school from some brothers, like you know what I mean? Like it, it, yeah. that's that's only in the last heckin' thirty five years. Like oh, so, I remember getting thumped around by brothers. You know what I mean? Like it's they still in living memory. There, but they were still teaching. Them. I was it's in still in living memory, man. Like the, the Catholic Church absolutely decimated this country and yeah. it's important that that that's called out it's yeah. important that that's called out in these stories and in these podcasts um, and that's the what, things they did were just if you, if you remember the last episode we were talking about the Eucharistic Congress and the, yeah. the huge crowds and yeah. the, the, everything that went with it and the level of wealth as well that they have I mean even, even to this present day you go to the Vatican you see Water is flowing in the streets. Oh. They've gold tops. They've the best finest art and collection of gold you could possibly I, imagine. Like you know, I've never seen so much gold. And and look, it, it's important to call it the Vatican Museum is absolutely spectacular. The Sistine oh, Chapel, I think, yeah, is, the, is, is, is the last the last thing you visit in in the Vatican Museum. So obviously, there's a lot of beauty and a lot of history there. But in terms of the Catholic Church's influence on in this country. It's yeah. but negativity, and and that well, needs to be called out. That's what I was gonna say. So, like you know, you, you, nineteen seventy nine, that millions of people going to see John Paul II, and then when you get to Francis, Pope Francis coming here a couple of years ago, there wasn't that. And churches are mostly empty. Churches are being demolished and and deconsecrated yeah. because the, the the numbers aren't there, and it all plays into it that all these atrocities and bad things perpetrated by the church. And look, they, the, the church, has, they've done good, good things, charity. They've done good things as well. You're right. They have, that, yeah, that needs to be called out. Months, they do fantastic work in Dublin. You can't argue with it. But all of those things have, have, have turned religion, especially Catholicism in Ireland, into a, a minimal force, whereas before it was the whole state, you know? Well, it ruled the country with an iron fist, and that was the problem in itself. Not yeah. George Charles McQuay, as Steve was talking about, like, um, yeah. He, yeah. he basically was in charge, you know, the Noel Brown and the, the, the mother and baby scheme, which was just giving maternity care to women, <sighs> put down because John Charles McQuay thought it was immoral and against Catholic teaching, and that's that. Continue to let, continue to let babies die for another 30, 40 years. It's shocking. Yeah, the tune baby yeah. home in another example. Oh, yeah. God. Gotcha. Yeah. Still going on. Like we see, um, it's Catherine Carlos is uh, still fighting in court to, you know, have have them exhumed and buried properly. And yeah, and still, it's all these things are still going on, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. And I suppose just to finish this off, as if as if what I said wasn't as, as horrifying enough, the 1940s uh, brought an era of high unemployment and pervasive poverty. So there was pressure on uh, the religious orders to, ca- uh, to cater for children but, uh, uh, during this year, but they found that this this house correction, it, like in line with, like, with the spike in po- uh, poverty during the 1940s, this, was, this home was also a big spike of pedophile priests in the 1940s. And we know uh, based on the, on the Murphy report and, you know, the priests that emerged, and uh, we saw in the early two thousands of a lot of priests like that. Uh, Father Brendan Great, or not Father Brendan Grace, but Fa- Fa- Brendan Murphy, or something like that. I believe Father Brendan was. Stack. No, uh, <laughs> Brendan Smith, I think his name was a really Brendan kind Smith. of yeah, 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 Brendan Smith, um, real, real horrifying figure. I think he was, he was like I suppose the uh, the main kind of figure for this kind of horror that ensued. But yeah, so officially the proposal was granted by the hierarchy in June 1945. And uh, part of that, there was a chaplain appointed to hear their confession at least once a week. Um, but the... So what and then, to be a fly on the wall there? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> How long do you have? Um, well, the, uh, uh, the rules drafted, the main one was priests couldn't leave. Essentially, it was a detention facility in all but name. An official clause was inserted giving Bishop Colahan the right to make whatever disciplinary regulations in connection with the house and its inmate he might deem necessary for the prevention of good order and good morals in the diocese. So it was a prison in all but name and, you know, the 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 powers that be had the 
uh, power to crack the whip should anybody get out of line, like, you know, Father Jack or anything like that. So it was not only Irish priests, but British priests were sent here as well from the Catholic Church. So there was a bit of a mixture there. So, yeah, it's just... Um, but, like, if the, the big thing that I didn't even uh, account for was, you know, the 1940s, uh, the stories that you told us, you know, 100,000... Uh, men and and or women potentially um, few of them at that stage would have been you know the Irish Guard uh, part of the Irish Guard you know this would have been was this ca- uh, caused by the wo- uh, World War or was this just going on and just a coincidence that's something that I think is a question mark that needs to be answered yeah. was there uh, uh, re- relation to it so that's that's something I'm fascinated to kind of delve into a bit more yeah. no it's a fair show to call that out I, you know I don't know if it's related to the war um, I, th- I think my opinion on it would be that the, the Catholic Church has so many of these scandals throughout the decades and the centuries that it doesn't really matter what part of history it was in it, it, was, yeah. it, was, it was still going to take place and, and as well as that I mean you know, World War 2 was only 20 odd years after World War 1 I mean, the world. Yeah, was, good the point. World was, the world was used to chaos, you know. Good um, point. Very good point. Albeit a much larger loss of life in World War Two, and and a much more further global reach uh, than in World War One. Good point. No, no. Yeah, no. It's a, it's an, it's an interesting I, one, already. Right, absolutely. Yeah, I'd agree. I'd say more coincidence. I'm sure some of them would have been worried about what was going to happen. You know. Nazis, the Russians afterwards, the communists as they were, um, weren't big on religion, you know, it has to be said. And I'm sure some of the worried, but it's not as said, yeah. Yeah. Maybe we just so many scandals in the 50s, the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, every decade, and probably well before. Yeah. Yeah. It just seems like that's what the church do. Scandal, you know. Yeah. Yep. Yep. In you, their nature, in their nature historically, that's the way it went. Yeah. That's that's it, and as you, as I, I think, it was Noel, you said earlier, um, you know, wasn't just Ireland, you know, Canada. You see, they've also had these homes and England and different places, and it's just it, it's it's in the nature of the business. I think of of, of Catholicism is scandal, you know. It's yeah, yeah. go hand in hand. Absolutely. Um. Well, as I think that's coming to the end of our of our episode, and and what an episode it's been. Um. Definitely the. By far and away, the most we've talked and discussed across a broad range of topics. Uh, I don't know about yourselves, but I've found it absolutely fascinating. Um, yeah, yeah. And I hope our I hope our listeners have too. Any any kind of closing comments from yourselves before we close? Me, it me. I just think next time, let's do the next one live. Oh yeah. I think now that we're uh, the first episode, I was petrified. Second, yeah. I was kind of a notch down, and I think this one. Less petrified, so I think the next one, let's all get together and uh, it'd be good to get together and get into it. We do it over a few beers in person or something. That's exactly what I'm getting yeah. to. We haven't done an in person one since the fourth one, so it'll definitely, definitely be worth it. We can bring the babies with us, still. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, we had Ripley as the uh, the mascot in the fourth episode. Yeah. Next one, we'll have the babies just wah. Wow. Love it, lads. Love it. <laughs> the two young daughters, they'll be uh they'll be front and center in the podcast, that's for sure. Yeah, you got that right. Right, lads, lovely stuff. Um, great talking to you, it's fascinating insights. And uh for all you listeners out there, please continue to like and subscribe, listen to us on Spotify and YouTube, and we're looking forward to broadcasting our next yeah. episode. Yeah, um, thanks to everybody. Um sorry to cut across your your beautiful outro Noel, but yeah, no, we like we uh, definitely see the numbers and we definitely see the subscribers and um, yep. uh, we thank everybody for giving it a listen we, we we see people we see people are listening so thank you for that and uh yeah uh sh- share it and let people know absolutely and the next episode as mentioned at the start we're going to focus on irish life the latter half in the 1940s between 1945 and 1949 so tune into that folks should be a good one thanks a lot for your time <laughs>